Hello and welcome to this latest episode in our series of Hangouts with Sigma Xi's Distinguished Lecturers. I'm Fenella Saunders. I'm the Managing Editor of American Scientist Magazine. We thank you for joining us today. This particular Hangout is hosted by the Research Triangle Park chapter of Sigma Xi, so thank you to everyone in that chapter for attending. Uh, if you are a Sigma Xi member and you have additional questions after this discussion, you can go to the lab, which is Sigma Xi's online communities page, and submit additional questions there, which we will get to the speakers. Today, we're very fortunate to have two speakers with us, both uh, working on the same project. We have distinguished lecturer Dr. Andrea Bertozzi, who is a professor of mathematics, and we also have Jess Jeff Brantingham, who's a professor of anthropology, both of them at our UCLA. Thank you both for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, the topic that we are discussing today uh, is one that's obviously quite relevant um, and also I think uh, a little bit confusing for people so hopefully we'll be able to clear up what is and isn't possible currently with prediction methods. Um, but first of all just to kind of frame the discussion of what we're talking about today and your project, um, in terms of the scope of the research and, and what you're able to sort of predict and model, um, events like this you know terrible shooting in Orlando that just happened and the campus shooting that just happened on your campus recently, those are kind of more isolated crime events versus things like gang violence or um, other types of crimes that are sort of based on connections to past events. Could you clarify if uh, one particular crime or another type is what you sort of more focus on and what you're able to model? Yeah, well, we're using um, statistical methods and these methods work very well when you have a large population where you've got um, a number of different interacting players in the in the process. So, for example, residential burglaries, um, criminals interacting with the environment, and then looking at how um, one event might trigger another event. Now, these kinds of actions could apply to so many different uh, behavior patterns. Um, you know, to date, we've mainly focused on crimes of opportunity. Um, and ones that happen fairly frequently. Jeff, do you want to add to that? That's right. I think I think the issue of predicting events, uh, it, a lot of it depends on the time scale that you're you're thinking about. If you're talking about wanting to predict crimes on time scales of uh, minutes to hours to maybe even days, you need very large populations of events in order to gain traction at that time scale. If you're talking about events like the shooting that happened in Orlando the other day or at UCLA, uh, it's potentially possible to predict those sorts of events, but on much longer time scales. So if you're trying to predict how many such events like that are going to occur over the course of a year or maybe two years or five years, it's possible to get traction on that. But from a from the point of view of can we predict such events on a very short time scale of, of hours to days, uh, the question, uh, the answer is probably no. Okay, so um, just again to, to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page, you, you were talking there about sort of statistically predicting events over time, over different time scales. So it's, it's not so much that you're predicting specific events, but you're rather predicting that there are certain areas where events are more likely to occur. That's right. We're looking at not just um, not just when the events are going to happen, but also where the the spatial location. Those are the two things that we tend to focus on. And at the end of the day, you're assigning sort of a probabilistic measure to those events occurring. And if those are if those predictions or forecasts are then in the hands of of uh, say police officers, then they can use that information as part of their decision making to say right, I know something about the probabilities of these events occurring, maybe I can try to optimize my time uh, within the constraints of all the other things I have to deal with. So the problem of predicting crime seems very large and messy. I'm wondering if you can describe a little bit how you even start to get a, a handle on it. How predictable is, for instance, something like human behavior, which is a big factor in, in something like this? That's right. So we actually, so we take it from a sort of different approach. Uh, we're not like tailing criminals and looking at how the criminals are making decisions. Rather, we're looking at actual patterns of events themselves and the location of the events. Um, and, and, you know, we, we try to, you know, we try to sort of see how much of these 
um, effects can be sort of lumped into the simplest model possible. You know, so for example, one of the first things we did in this project, going back about 10 years now, was we looked at the patterns in residential burglary. And in particular, if you have a house that's broken into, um, what what happens to the space-time scenario of what's going to, you know, in that general vicinity of that house? Does the probability of a, another break-in at the same location, does that suddenly go up? What about the neighbors? Do things, does, do the probabilities change at their houses? And it turns out that you can quantify those things very carefully. Um, you know, you can map them to the statistical data. You can come up with a pretty solid model that describes these um, kinds of likelihoods. I have even used this myself. You know, what, there was an incident in my own neighborhood where my next door neighbor had a break in. I actually called the patrol and I said, I would like extra patrols around my house for the next two weeks and they said why and I said because my neighbor was broken into and I know from my research that the probability of my house getting broken into is going up for a couple of weeks right and they were very receptive they said okay we'll do it you know so yeah I, yeah. Think, I, I think that focus on events is really key and one of the reasons why that that uh, is sounds surprising to uh, a, a, you know the lay audience uh, or to people who don't work with those sorts of uh, data is that when people think about crime, they often think about the motives of the offenders themselves. Right. But if you if you think about it, um, motives and crimes are like a many to one relationship. So if you think about a car theft, right, there are many different motives that might drive the reason why yeah. somebody would steal a car. In Los Angeles, for example, people steal cars for fun. They steal cars in order to get money out of uh, fencing that car or chopping up that car. They steal cars for the purposes of commute, right? So they'll actually steal a car to drive to work. Uh, they'll steal cars because they want to uh, move that entire car across the border. Um, many different motives for stealing cars lead to a singular events, which is a car theft at, at a particular location. It turns out that in many cases, uh, what's driving where and when crime occurs is less dependent upon the motives than on the structure of the opportunities. Right. And that's why we can focus in on the events themselves rather than on the motives and gain a lot of traction in predicting where and when those crimes will occur. So there are there are a lot of other sort of complicated prediction models out there um, for, for other things that are unrelated to crime, you know, for instance, climate modeling, earthquake modeling, um, uh, game theory. I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the other sort of background areas of research that you tapped into in order to develop the models that you're working on here. Yeah, so we actually tapped into two classes of models. Um, we, we looked very carefully at some spatiotemporal models initially that came from well, they involve partial differential equations, but they were very similar to um, kinds of models that people use when they study things like bacterial chemotaxis. That's a technical term, but it basically refers to certain kinds of microorganisms. They will change the environment around them and make the environment more hospitable um, to other microorganisms, and they'll, they'll cause these aggregations to form. And so when Jeff and I started working together, he, he saw some of my work on swarming models in biology and thought that this would be an interesting approach to look at for crime. Um, a second kind of model arose in our team um, within a few years, and that was mainly spearheaded by George Muller, who was a postdoc here at the time. And those were models related to earthquakes and aftershocks. And so the idea is that when you have an earthquake, it triggers more earthquakes that are typically referred to as aftershocks. And so the question was whether crime has the same kind of statistical pattern. Um, and it turns out to be a wonderful model for human activity, and it's not a surprise to us at all. We've taken these classes of models, the self-exciting point process models, and we've now applied them not only to things like residential burglary, but also to IED attacks in the Middle East, right? And we've, mo we've t used them to model um, email traffic, looking at just, just kind the kind of interaction interactions you have. It's not crime, it's just human activity, right? If I send you, Fenella, an email, the likelihood of you responding to that email goes way up compared to if I didn't send you an email. I mean, it seems, right, it seems very silly, right, to even talk about it, but, but that's exactly what we're talking about here. Now, you mentioned before that um, these 
sorts of models work really well with large amounts of data. Can we sort of quantify what you mean by large amounts? Again, it depends sort of on the time scale, but uh, if you're looking at doing crime prediction on the order of uh, uh, days uh, to uh, maybe weeks, you can gain some traction with hundreds of events. Again, it actually depends on the temporal and the spatial scale. So within a, a particular region, with hundreds of events, you can start to get some, some traction. Um, you know, when you move down into very rare events, obviously you need to increase the temporal scale over which you want to, you know, try to, try to forecast to increase the population size in that way. Right. So most police departments, even relatively small police departments, can find hundreds of events in their jurisdictions and start to use these models for uh, prediction purposes. That's right. You know, another thing that, um, we, you know, we've, we've started looking at, but um, something where I, I would really like to see more work done is looking not only at the major crimes, but looking at auxiliary kinds of information. You know, so one thing that we've started to try to model, we have one paper out on this, is looking at the graffiti when you have gang activity, right? The gangs are using gang tags with spray paint to mark areas. And that's not the same thing as a drive-by shooting in any in any sense, but nevertheless, if one were to keep track of that information, kind of like the broken windows effect that we look at for some of the more straightforward crimes like residential burglary, that information may also be quite useful. Um, we don't have that information, but we've already started to work on models about how we would use it if we had it. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that at one point once we got a little bit more into there, but since we're talking about that now, do you think that using models like this can actually affect the kind of data that police are collecting? So if graffiti wasn't as influential to what they did before, but now it's some predictor, would they start recording that sort of thing? I think the, the answer is absolutely yes. And, and uh, there are a couple of things to recognize about this. One is that you know, the police have been going through a, a, a data management revolution over the past decade, and they're probably uh, five, six, seven years behind private industry in this. Uh, for you know, a variety of reasons, the public sector tends to move quite a bit slower in terms of technology. Uh, but uh, as they use more and more data as part of their day-to-day -day operations, as part of managing police um, the police enterprise, they recognize that they need to collect data more efficiently and they need to collect it more accurately and they need to have the mechanisms whereby they can put that those data to use. And so for those police departments that are using predictive policing in the field, they almost universally immediately realize that there's something about the way that they're collecting data that they need to do better. And so you can imagine the types of results we see in terms of predictive accuracy today are the, is accuracy based on the imperfections that are in the data. If they can improve some of the things about how they collect their data, for example, the spatial resolution or the temporal resolution, uh, these sorts of things, uh, predictions can only improve because of the data quality that's going into it. Great. Um, so, Dr. Bertozzi, you, um, you asked before, um, you mentioned before about the um, self-excitation models that you use. Could you explain what those are and, and sort of the principle behind that? Well, they're very simple. I mean, it's very much like earthquake prediction. So you have, a, you have an earthquake and then um, there is some likelihood, suddenly as soon as the earthquake happens, the probability of another earthquake happening um, goes way up, so that's the time component, but there's also a spatial component. So, you know, an earthquake in California is very unlikely to trigger an earthquake in Florida, but an earthquake in Los Angeles could, um, you know, in downtown LA, for example, God forbid, could um, trigger, you know, an aftershock where I live in Santa Monica, for example. So. That's just one, that's just one, uh, you know, so the spatial scales for earthquakes are, are much larger than the typical spatial scales for the spread of crime. If you have a house that's broken into, um, you know, you're not going to have necessarily an excitation even, even half a mile away, right? It might just be within that block. That's right. We can right? measure actually very precisely how far that area of influence extends out from uh, one crime to essentially daughter events or self-excited events. And it's typically on the order of, of 
uh, you know, it really disappears as an effect out beyond about a mile. Yeah. Yeah. And it depends also on what the particular crime is. If this is a crime where there's going to be, you know, foot traffic involved to commit the crime, then the lane scale really is a, a scale on which people walk, which in LA is pretty short, right? So, whereas if it's a crime that would involve, you know, a vehicle, then that could potentially be a further distance. And that's just common sense. That's right. But you see that in the data. And I, I think an important thing about this model uh, is that, you know, we talk about earthquakes uh, as, a, as a, it was a source of sort of the mathematics, um, and we talk about it as an analogy for human behavior, but I think the analogy is far uh, more uh, direct than is often, um, often talked about, so, so, and it's very relevant to human behavior across a whole set of domains. So I, I would, you know, off the top of my head say, you know, I could imagine modeling uh, anybody's uh, visitation of restaurants in very much the same way. Exactly. You might choose just out of the blue to go and visit a particular restaurant, right? And that's like the earthquake that just occurs out of the blue along the San Andreas Fault. But once you go there, you say, oh my God, the food was so amazing. And that brings you back two days later to go back to that same restaurant. And now that you've recognized that that restaurant is good, maybe you look at the restaurant that's right next door and you say, well, wait a second, I didn't know this area had great restaurants. Maybe I can go to this next place and you have another great meal there and your sort of appreciation for food in that lo that area spreads through a little sort of self-excitation right. process. Right, right. That's uh, exactly, that's exactly how it works. And a lot of aspects of human behavior are like this. So it's not just about crime. It's, it's really a property of human behavior, how it is we discover new locations and engage in uh, new behaviors and how those events themselves spread to additional exploration of those areas. Yeah, I would say one big difference between what we're doing and what, you know, a lot of the public sort of, how they might traditionally view um, solving crimes, um, you know, we're, le we're much less focused on the individuals committing the crime um, as we are the targets of the crime. The, the you know, the spatial targets when the, the likelihood is for that area to be a target. So we're focusing much more on the actions rather than, um, you know, the motives or the individuals. You know, that's, we just, um, that was kind of a big discovery for our team. Um, you know, Jeff had these ideas going forward from the beginning. He comes from social science and he basically came to those of us who are in the quantitative sciences who've worked, I mean, you know, we, none of us had had experience working in social science prior to this effort. And he came to us and said, I have these ideas. How should we model these? How can we quantify these? And we just sort of took off. And what was really wonderful about the collaboration was the, um, you know, the not only the response we got from our colleagues in the field, but also the response we got from the young people who want to, um, you know, develop their own careers working in this area. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, just to, to reemphasize, um, everybody, thinks when they hear about a prediction in crime that we're talking about predicting who is going to commit a crime. Um, and, you know, that may be an important in some circumstances, but actually it's a very challenging problem for a number of reasons. One is the motives to event uh, problem. Right. Um, the other pro another problem is one of uh, you just limit yourself tremendously. So if you think about something like residential burglary, only about 12% of burglaries are ever solved, so to speak, through the identification of a suspect. So if you limit yourself to trying to figure out who is committing a crime, you're actually limiting yourself to a tiny fraction of the total events that are out there. So in one sense, you could say by focusing on just the events themselves, you, uh, uh, just focusing on the events themselves, you end up uh, covering a much broader swath of the crime that's occurring. And uh, have a bigger impact on society overall. So when you're actually building these models, I mean, you're using a lot of data um, to build them as well. Can you talk about um, some of the data that goes into the development of the models and the timescales over which those occur? Because you're probably using data for a much longer period to actually sort of, sort of create the model than maybe, you know, the daily data that you're using to actually run the model when you're trying to see what crime is going to be like over the next day or whatever it is. 
Yeah, typically, uh, typically we look at years worth of data in the background um, uh, for predicting crime today. And uh, the process is an evolving one, not unlike uh, uh, Netflix, right? Uh, uh, they have your entire movie watching history in the background. Um, and the movie you watch today changes the way the model that's in the background appreciates how it is that your tastes are evolving. In the same way that we have lots of crime data going back years uh, uh, in, in the background, and the events that occur today change how it is that we view the likelihood of crime occurring tomorrow. So it's very much um, an evolving process where you're constantly adding new events to the database uh, in such a way that it, it changes your appreciation of how the crimes will occur. So what sorts of data go into this kind of, of crime prediction model? I mean, you were talking about burglaries um, and possibly gang violence. Are there other types of crime data that are used? So actually, this is a, this is a fascinating question. The only data that we've really worked with over the long term is strictly uh, the minimum of what you need to classify an event. So we talk about what type of crime is it. So it's a classification provided by the police department. Where did it occur and when did it occur? Just those three things. And you might say to yourself, well, what about street networks? And what about weather patterns? And what about demographic characteristics and all of these things? Um, I'm sort of of two minds of that. One is uh, that a lot of that stuff that we want to believe is really important for understanding crime actually is not nearly as important as we think it is, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, you know, I'm a social scientist, and this is fairly provocative to say, but there are as many theories of the way poverty drives crime as there are sociologists on the planet, right? And so <laughs> as, a, as a result, it's very difficult to figure out how do we actually use information about um, poverty or socioeconomic status as a component of models to forecast crime. A second view would be sort of along the lines of, of uh, this is a, almost a machine learning type uh, a view, sort of a philosophical view, that all of that additional information is already built into the events themselves. So you can think of it as the event has already distilled all of those other variables in driving where and when it occurs. And I actually experience this with police officers all the time. I go in and I say to them, let me tell you, there was a, a cluster of assaults that occurred at 2.30 in the morning at the corner of walk and don't walk. And I say, well, what do you think is going on around there? And they say, well, there's got to be a bar or something that lets people out at 2.30 in the morning. The truth is you don't need to go and map the bar in order to understand or have information about what's driving the cluster of crimes. It's already built into the crimes itself. So... While it may be interesting to go out and map all of these other additional variables, um, it often doesn't provide you that much more information. And the costs of trying to gather those data and maintain them also becomes in, uh, incredibly prohibitive. That's right. That's right. I mean, we have examples where the auxiliary data is really useful, but they tend to be special cases. I mean, one example is we have a paper on residential burglaries where we were trying to come up with a better way of of creating sort of a heat map of where these things would occur. And we actually used um, data of where people live, this kind of census data, if you will, um, of the, the population, population distribution in the city at a very fine scale. And that's sort of obvious, that if you're talking about residential burglaries, you have to know where the residences are, right? Um, because, you know, it just sort of makes sense. But, but things that are much less well connected to the crimes, um, you know, you could go crazy trying to um, quantify at a very granular level the complexity of just our world, but that's really not, um, that's really not so helpful for these kinds of statistical models. Really, you want a model that has the fewest parameters possible. And there's, you know, well-grounded statistical methods that tell us that that's the right approach to take. So are, is your model being tested? You're saying you mentioned burglaries. Is it being tested on other violent crimes, like for shootings or, or anything like that? Or is it mostly just break-ins? Uh, no, actually, it, it's uh, it's been tested on a wide array of crime types, both violent and uh, property crimes. Everything in the property space, everything from burglary to car theft to burglary theft from vehicle to uh, personal theft, and violent crimes, uh, assaults, gang crimes, 
uh, gun related crimes, yes. uh, robberies, uh, and so forth. And uh, if you think about it, what we're really doing is predicting events. And the, the crimes themselves are really labels that attach to those uh, events. Now, those labels might contain I interesting information, and this is part of where our current research is, is pointing. So, for example, you might imagine that uh, an assault with a deadly weapon has a bigger impact on the possibility of future crime than a purse snatching, right? Um, but it's not always obvious that that's the case. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. A great sort of connection back to the earthquake models is to say uh, a assault with a deadly weapon is a higher magnitude event, like a higher magnitude earthquake, whereas a purse snatching is a lower magnitude event. And there's great mathematics that could be drawn on to uh, look at those relationships. Are you actually, is your model sort of ranking those, the, the magnitude of those events? Or is that something that's programmed into the model? Not right now. Not right now. Those yeah. are things that uh, uh, suggest future research possibilities. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm also curious, um, I'm sure that uh, some people think that this kind of modeling is potentially a little invasive or scary, obviously, if they don't understand the, what you're focusing on. Do you often have to address questions of privacy or, or bias or sort of involvement with the local community or, or things like that? Yeah, this is a, that's a fantastic question, and uh, we're always uh, concerned about uh, those sorts of civil liberties uh, uh, issues that arise around this, but um, it turns out that uh, the types of data that we're dealing with uh, are actually uh, favorable from the point of view of the use of data within the context of, of security problems uh, and policing. And so think about it this way. We work with event data, right? Burglaries, robberies, homicides, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, one thing that the public might not know in general is that anywhere from 90 to 95, 97 percent of those events are actually reported to the police by the public. The police don't discover those crimes. Right. And so if you think about it, these are the crimes that the public is calling the police about and saying, we want you to do something about these events. And by using those events in prediction, you're actually being responsive to public demand. Mm -hmm. right? Another thing about this is that because we're only looking at the what, where, and when of uh, the crimes themselves, is it a burglary? Where did it occur? When did it occur? It's not actually about targeting people. Mm -hmm. It's about saying, where's the risk of crime the greatest? And from the point of view of if a police officer can go into one of those locations and prevent a crime, just by being there, engaging a member of the public, changing the opportunities, actually all, all sort of co components of the system benefit, right? The police officer benefits in the sense that they don't actually have to then go back and deal with a crime uh, and all the reporting and uh, all the other costs that are associated with that. The victims obviously benefit if a crime can be prevented because now they don't have all of the, you know, the, the, the challenges uh, that arise from being a victim. And even though they might not see it this way, the offenders also benefit in that they've had one less opportunity to run afoul of the criminal justice system. Uh, crime prevention is really what this is about, rather than targeting particular individuals for additional police or security scrutiny. It's really about preventing crimes before they happen. That's right, and I would, and even at the low, even even with the few models we have that actually model the behavior of the criminals, we also assume the criminals are identical. So they don't have a race, they don't have a gender, they don't have you know, a citizenship, right? They're just identical people That's right. in our models. Um, and we really like that. It actually makes the mathematics a lot easier, frankly, if they all look the same. We have, it would be a much harder problem if we tried to model, um, you know, tried to profile the people. That's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've recently been giving a, a number of talks uh, in the context of uh, big data and uh, uh, civil liberties. And there's a question that, that we'll always bump into, uh, and, and I think it's an important question, and that is, even if you could do something, there may be reasonable ethical uh, reasons for not doing it, right? So uh, when it comes down to predicting who would commit a crime, that runs uh, headlong into all sorts of constitutional uh, protections. And that's where uh, 
science needs uh, ethical and legal responsibilities. And if we're going to, you know, if you choose to work in this space of doing big data for uh, policing, data analytics for policing, you have to be cognizant of what those, uh, what those limits are. Yep. Okay. So obviously this started out as an academic endeavor to begin with. I'm wondering if you can describe the process of actually getting this into use in police departments because that's not a given with a lot of research projects. Many of them never see practical use. No, I, I think what I, to answer that question, I'm going to start, I'm going to start the answer and then trade it off to Jeff. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it actually, the, the first use of this kind of, these kinds of predictive policing methods, um, at least connected to our program um, in the field, started actually in the city of Santa Cruz, California. And that was um, our, our colleague, George Moeller, um, was contacted by the city of Santa Cruz asking if, he had software that they could use and we weren't really planning to roll stuff out quite that quickly but you know George thought well this is great you know they I can just write them some software and they could try it out now Santa Cruz unlike unlike Los Angeles Santa Cruz was essentially doing no quantitative analysis for their patrols so they went from nothing to trying out our stuff um, and the first month they tried this method, um, they had, I think, a 27% reduction in crime in Santa Cruz, which, which was really quite something. So that kind of, we got some media attention from that, um, and um, it kind of helped jumpstart the, the very lengthy um, study that Jeff spearheaded um, starting in Los Angeles in November of 2011, and I'll turn that over to him now to answer. Yeah, I, 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 I think based on the, that very initial uh, deployment of, of a, a, a prototype software, if mm -hmm. you will, uh, in Santa Cruz, we mounted uh, an experiment, a randomized controlled experiment in Los Angeles that ran for 21 months, a very, very long in duration randomized controlled experiment. And I should say that at that point, we were still very much a bunch of geeky researchers doing basic <laughs> research. It was. We were really about trying to answer uh, fundamental questions about you know uh, science and, uh, and, uh, and and crime. We were I was actually I, I'm happy to say quite naive about uh, uh, the potential implications of of uh, what we were doing uh, in the in the broader scheme of things. But it became quite clear to me within you know just a few weeks of starting those experiments that um, that. Uh, something more was going on here. In fact, within about the first month or so of running the experiments in Los Angeles, we received phone calls from more than 200 police departments saying, we want to know how to get a hold of this uh, sort of stuff. And, and that was by spreading of word of mouth, really. Um, and here was an interesting revelation from, from uh, our point of view is that, or my point of view is that um, we sort of realized that the, 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 tools and techniques that we had built for the purposes of scientific study mm -hmm. were really not well suited to the rigors of day-to-day -day use. There's a big difference between something that you build to accomplish a scientific goal and something that you, uh, you can build that's um, reality-proof, meaning it's not going to break on a day-to-day -day basis. Yep. And it was at that point where you decide, do we just leave this to be a scientific project right. and have it, uh, have it be out there and have it potentially not you know, make the transition to day-to-day -day use? Or do we turn it into, uh, try to really turn it into something that um, is robust? And I, I, you know, I am a believer that that does require proper sort of commercialization uh, processes. You can't just turn loose research uh, research results and expect it to um, grab a hold and and uh, and and take off. Well, well, not only that, Jeff, but um, you know, to have the software deployed in lots of different jurisdictions. I mean, you know, we at UCLA are here to do basic research. My students are here to discover new things, and they're not here to write lots of software for lots of different police agencies. So, so you know, just the practicalities of getting that um, material, you know, the media and everything, um, uh, you know, the software and everything that goes with it, to get that deployed in lots of different um, 
areas that have different weather patterns, that have different geography, that have different local cultures in terms of how the police interact with people. That's something that really has to be taken outside of the university setting to make that a success. And I think that that's happened. Yeah. yeah. And I'll say that one of one of the most uh, rewarding things that have come out of this whole process, if you think, think about it, uh, Andrea and I started working together back in late 2005, early yep. 2006. So it's been a decade mm -hmm. uh, that we've been uh, collaborating. Right. And I've had, uh, I've been, you know, blessed really to have the opportunity to go from extremely rudimentary basic ideas through the development of basic research and testing uh, of, of ideas through to development of field experiments and ultimately through the, the process of getting that into the ha hands of police officers and having an impact on the real world. I mean, how many people actually get the opportunity to see that, that whole cycle from, you know, a nubbin of an idea all the way through to something really deployed and, and, and having an impact in the real world? I feel, you know, incredibly grateful to have Andrea as a collaborator. Oh. Uh, Please. And the police department <laughs> as, as a collaborator Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. No, this is, it's been great to be part of this. Um, the, when I give lectures, to, especially the Sigma Psi talks, um, when I give lectures to the public, when I, I always give them an example of, you know, the sort of typical time scale that we are used to for basic research to get into public use. The example I give them is, I tell them a story, I said when I was 13 years old, I had an account this was in 1978. I had an account on a computer that was networked into a network of computers in the US called the ARPANET. Okay? And, you know, I remember surfing the ARPANET with my little tourist account and discovering Pentagon computers. And I mean, it was pretty cool to be 13 and finding all this stuff, but none of this was commercial and the rest of the world had no access to it. And it wasn't until the late 1990s or the early 1990s, excuse me, 15 years later that the internet actually went commercial, the big dot com boom. And, you know, and that was still quite, quite, you know, a, a while back and think about how the internet kind of rules our lives, right? Um, you know, our project, of course, is much smaller, but we went from, you know, an idea that Jeff and I talked about over lunch in about six or seven years, suddenly we're de starting to deploy this stuff in the field. That's unbelievable as far as that kind of time scale. It was pretty exciting to um, be a part of that and see it happen so quickly. So um, when you're police departments are using your model to to run say predictions for the next day um, how is the the data for for that particular run actually sort of being inputted into the model are, do they have systems to do that automatically or do they have analysts who are doing that specifically as part of their daily routine yeah so the company that emerged out of this um, is essentially uh, what's called a SaaS company a software as service company um, the, uh, the company's servers that are out there in the cloud are hooked up live to police department's records management systems. And it's fully automated. As the police add new crime events to their database, those automatically are incorporated into uh, the predictions that are then delivered on a, um, you know, an hourly or a daily basis to the police department. So, um, it's a fully automated process, which I think is uh, is essential uh, in today's in today's world. Um, you know, crime analysts are are a critical part of many police departments, but recognize uh, crime analysts are mostly available to medium size or large police departments, not the smaller police departments That's around right. our country. Um, and there are many things that they have to deal with. One of the things that uh, uh, that this sort of predictive uh, policing software can do for them is it can automate a, a process that is very cumbersome for them to do by hand on a daily basis and it improves upon accuracy and it frees up time for them to concentrate on really challenging problems right uh, about figuring out who the offenders are mm -hmm. um, uh, or, or, or whatnot right I, in fact if you go and look at we have a paper that just came out in the Journal of the American Statistical Association on the field studies and if you in that paper are some beautiful examples of the maps that were created by crime analysts versus the maps created by the software and you'll see that the crime analysts 
um, they have very different things going on in their head compared to what this automated algorithm comes up with. You know, they may be thinking very much more sort of historically rather than forecasting forward. And that's a, you know, that's a really big deal um, that we can that we can automate this process of forecasting forward. And, and that sort of removes um, a little bit of what I might consider to be a geographic bias that the crime analyst has just because it's human nature to think that way. That's right. Um, and one way of thinking about where uh, accuracy comes from, and I'll, I'll answer a question that just popped up on the message board here. When we look at the, the, um, uh, at the research, Typically, the predictive algorithm is doubling the amount of crime that's predictive relative to uh, a, an expert in the field. And the expert in the field, uh, so the crime analyst, is functioning very much like a, a hotspot map. They're able to look at where crimes have occurred in the recent past, right. seven days, 14 days, 28 days, and mimic that process quite well. The predictive algorithms are actually doubling the amount of crime that uh, that that you're predicting. Now, one of the questions is, where does this advantage come from? Um, and a, a really good analogy for that, uh, I think, is one that you'll never forget, is if you were to think to yourself, okay, I need to name my top 20 favorite breakfast cereals in order from one to 20, right? <laughs> so numbers one, two, and three are easy, right? You can think off the top of your head, right? I always eat Raisin Bran as my number one, and when I'm done with the Raisin Bran, I go into Corn Flakes, and when I'm done with Corn Flakes, I go on to Mini Wheats, and that's the way it is. Those are my preferences, right? right? And that's just, ever since I was a kid, it was that way. But when you get to cereals four, five, and six, it's a little bit harder, right? On average, you like Weetabix a little bit better than Rice Krispies. You like Rice Krispies a little bit better than Cocoa Puffs. But today, maybe you just feel like eating Cocoa Puffs because that's the way it is today. And then if you think about it, you get down to like cereals 18, 19, and 20, and you're making it up. You really do not know 20 breakfast cereals off the top of your head. You'd have to be standing in the aisle at the supermarket to figure out which one is actually 17 and which one is 18 and which one is 19. And predicting crime is very, very similar, right? Police departments actually don't need predictive policing to know where hotspots one, two, and three are, right? It's always been that way and police know that they can drive straight out the front door right down to hotspot number one and probably get a, an arrest within a matter of minutes. And that's just the nature of environments. Every environment has a couple of chronic locations that are just incredibly difficult to solve. Right. But when you get to hotspots four, five, and six, it's a little more challenging. Yes, on average, four is a little bit hotter than five, and five is a little bit hotter than six. But today, is it that way? Yeah. And if, and if you go to six instead of four, you know, maybe you miss an opportunity. And then if you get down to hotspots 17, 18, 19, 20, you're making it up. Police are making it up. Analysts are making it up. The algorithm doesn't have that same limitation. It can look at every single event in the context of the complete history in space and time right. and make a much more accurate call about this is hotspot 17 today or this is hotspot 12 today. And that's where the advantage comes in. It's not that the, I mean, the human brain does amazing things. In this particular context, the algorithm has an advantage in being able to manage a much larger volume of data to, to pinpoint that risk. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So one of the other things that I think you talked about in, in some of your previous talks uh, has been this idea of hotspots and um, how if you address one hotspot, it just kind of moves it maybe down the road. Um, oh, and you, more. Yeah. So you uh -huh. talked about, I wonder if you could talk about that and modeling that and perhaps helping police solve that problem. Oh, that's a tricky problem. Yeah, displacement of hotspots. So uh, one of the examples I showed is our PNAS paper from 2010. That's a little earlier work. Um, the point of that paper was really to, so let me back up a little bit. Um, so one of the m types of models that we've looked at in our studies are agent-based models. So those are models where you're modeling individual criminals making choices and you're looking at the environment that they're going into and how the environment changes. Um, so when I, when I mentioned that we model, we have models with individual people in them, but the people are all the same, I was really thinking about the agent-based models. So all these people are identical in the models, but nevertheless, they're making 
little decisions and they're running around and they're interacting with their environment. So what we wanted to show, and I should mention agent-based models are very, very well known in social science um, modeling. It's probably one of the most um, well-used class of models. And the model that we had, the, the first paper we published was on um, residential burglaries, as we mentioned. It was a very simple model with a very few parameters, and but it was nonlinear, and it was sort of a complex system. So it turns out that um, our group here at UCLA, are, we are experts in that general class of models, not necessarily applied to crime, but in general. So we were able to make quite a lot of analytical predictions about the model itself, not about what's actually happening in real life, but about the model, this kind of model used to describe real life. Um, and we wrote a paper that was really meant to show the social scientists kind of the power of quantitative analysis applied to agent-based models because that's somewhat underutilized in social sciences. And we think that this is an area that could be expanded up at the level of the quantitative sciences. Now, there's another question, which is how well does that model mimic what's happening in real life? Um, so the model has things that are really great. Like it can very accurately describe how changes to um, probabilities of break-ins and things like that happen over time. What the model did not do as well, and this is basically a lack of information issue, is that it's hard to model people's decision-making and movement patterns if you don't have any field data about the people, okay? And so, so the point is that we can't go and watch criminals in action, right, while they're committing crimes. Um, that's, you know, for obvious reasons, right? If they knew we were watching, they wouldn't be committing the crime, maybe. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of civil, civil liberties issues. So we basically don't have that data. It's that that's basically half of the model we had to use common sense and the other half of the model we used very sharp quantitative um, results from the data. So I think that's about everything I can say, at least on the basic research side, but Jeff can probably add to that. Well, and so what was so amazing about that model is that it, it allowed us to provide a, a possible answer to a long-standing uh, empirical paradox uh, from criminology. Going back to the late 1980s and early 1990s, there were a series of, of experiments um, in uh, what's called hotspot policing, which uh, led to uh, uh, two types of results. So hotspot policing is you essentially have a, cluster, uh, a concentrated area of crime or an area where it experiences a lot of crime. You put police on that hotspot. And what occurred in these studies was that oftentimes, if you press down on that hotspot, the crime would just disappear. It didn't displace around the corner, but sometimes uh, if they did push down on it, crime would displace around the corner. And there was no really compelling reason for explaining why sometimes crime is displaced and why sometimes it's not. And these models, uh, the, the partial differential equation uh, models that arose out of uh, these early studies of burglary provided one of the first very, uh, early explanations for why you get these uh, these two different uh, types of uh, uh, impacts of policing. On the one hand, to boil it down to sort of the simplest uh, uh, part of it, if you have a, a system wherein any little spike in crime is sufficient to generate a new hotspot, it creates a nucleation point, right? If you push down on this one hotspot, then there are these little spikes in crime that are occurring throughout the environment, each one of which can become the nucleation point for a new hotspot. Right? In other types of environments, what we call subcritical environments, it really takes a big spike in crime to suck in all the offenders into that location to generate a new hotspot. And if you push down on that type of hotspot, little spikes in crime aren't going to generate a new one. It requires another big spike in crime. And here we see a, a really nice formal mathematical uh, description, the difference between supercritical and subcritical hotspots, mm -hmm. providing an explanation for an a potential explanation for an empirical phenomena that would not have been um, apparent without the mathematics. And I think that's, that's uh, for me, one of the, you know, the great results is here is mathematics leading to insights that would not have been available in any other way. Right. That's right.
Yeah, okay. it, was, it was kind of fun for us on the math side because these ideas had been used for a couple decades in other areas of science, mainly in the physical sciences and biological sciences. And it was kind of fun to be one of the first papers out there applying these ideas to social sciences. So we can actually, I'll just say, turn around and, and ask the question, why displacement seems like it should be so logical that if you go and police this area, well, the offender is just going to go down somewhere else and commit a crime somewhere else. But in truth, if you think about it from the offender's point of view, the reason why they target a location is because that's their low-hanging fruit. Right. That's where it's easy for them. That's where it's attractive for them. And if you take away those attractive locations, you take away their low-hanging fruit, the next place is just not quite as good. And oftentimes they'll just go into the house and play Xbox rather right. than, uh, rather than go, uh, uh, go down around the corner and commit the crime. Right. Right. I guess it depends on the motivation of the criminal in that sense, though. That's true. And, and actually, this is, a, this is a key question about the type of predictions we use uh, with police officers. You know, uh, we're really about delivering short-term predictions that help the officer who has to patrol the streets today. They're about preventing the robbery today, the burglary today. People could turn around and say, yeah, but you're not solving the root causes of crime. Mm -hmm. You're not solving drug addiction or poverty. And my answer to that is, its goal is not to solve those things. Those things are absolutely important. Mm -hmm. And we have to do something about those as a society. These sorts of uh, methods are about giving the police officer on the street the ability to get out in front of crime today. Right. Um, so, uh, 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 I, I don't think we should really think be thinking about either or preventing burglary today or solving poverty. We need to be thinking about both of those things simultaneously. Right. Right. Do you think that in the future, a model like this could incorporate a wider range of data, like, for instance, um, information from social media or, or something like that? Uh, very good question. Yes, we are actually working with social media. Um, we have a project right now underway looking at, um, well, it's, we call it human terrain modeling. So we're looking at what's going on in urban environments and different parts of cities and, and how much of this can you glean from social media activity. In particular, where we have a bunch of data sets um, that we're looking at that's Twitter feed with geotags. So these are people who have smartphones with a GPS tracker on the phone and they they make a tweet and the tweet records both the tweet itself but also the geographic location of where the tweet came from. So we're having, um, we're ha having some really interesting ongoing work in that area. We're looking at a number of foreign cities and, and also Los Angeles. We have a paper coming out very soon about um, LA Twitter data. That's right. And, and I, I, think, I think, yes, absolutely. There are many forms of data that can be used to gain a better understanding of human behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and from a, uh, from a basic research point of view, uh, it's really exciting to explore the connections between those different types of data. For example, one of the things we've been looking at with social media data is the question of whether or not the uh, social media events themselves are embedded in people's daily routines, or does the social media, media drive their routine? Right. right? There's a big difference. Right. If I'm if I, where I tweet and when I tweet is part and process of the, the, my trip from home to work, right? I have to do that every day. Then the social media, what I'm tweeting about, is not actually impacting my movement patterns. Mm -hmm. um, that's quite different from saying I'm tweeting about a location and then I go to that location. Mm -hmm. uh, those are two very different mechanisms, and uh, both may be at play in human populations um, and tell us something about uh, human behavior overall. So absolutely. Uh, those those different sorts of data uh, could potentially be very useful, uh, and there's a, a bright future, if you mm -hmm. will, for uh, for using those sorts of data. Yeah, I would say that to date, our use of social media has not been focused on using it for crime. We've been mainly using it to understand what the content is of social media, where and when it occurs. Very little of it, if any has a direct con direct connection to crime. But there's a lot of very interesting things out there. Like, for example, we're looking at the year 2011 in Madrid, um, and there were some protest movements that took place, you know, kind of similar to the Occupy movements here in the U.S. And so looking at when those occurred and how maybe they affected the elections and what 
um, information about those is on social media. Um, we're looking at tourists um, who speak different languages coming into the city at different times of the year. There's a lot of, you get this sort of um, broad brushstroke picture of what's happening in the city that's really quite, um, it's quite fun to see actually. Once you, once you take, we can take, you know, millions of tweets and we can, we can organize them using our software into different categories and then start combing through those in a very rapid fashion, looking at different, different times of the year and different locations and what's going on. It's pretty exciting. Well, we've only got a couple minutes left, so I was hoping to sort of ask you some questions that go uh, a little higher level into science in general, just to wrap up here. Uh, the two of you are, are sort of exemplary of this process because you're in such different fields, but I wonder if you could talk about the value of working in a cross-disciplinary team when you're trying to make advances in science. Oh, it's it's wonderful. Um, I mean, why do we do this? You do this because you can solve problems that are much bigger than what you could do on your own. Um, that's why you team up with people. Um, you know, it's for me, it's not very interesting to work on problems that only require my expertise. Um, you know, I sort of feel like I've already done those things. And well, I like to be part of a team that's bigger than just me, um, that can have a much bigger impact. Um, I'll let Jeff say what he wants. To yeah, say I, 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 I completely agree with that. And I, I would also say that um, it's at the interface of these different disciplines where I think uh, big innovations are, are waiting to be found. Um, you know, I think of uh, the, the quantitative social sciences today very much like uh, where the biological sciences were in the 1960s. And think about the, the, the swath of discoveries in both ecology and genomics uh, that followed those early pioneering works of mathematicians uh, working uh, with, alongside biologists on these important biological problems. We're still experiencing the, the, the fruits of that today. Social science um, and social sciences has uh, is no less complex than the biological realm. I think. No, and, and more there's so. uh, and I think that uh, there's plenty of opportunities. Now, having said that, speaking as a social scientist, I think there is a challenge with working at the interface of, of the quantitative sciences and the social sciences, and that is one of the social scientists have to realize that if they want to make progress, they have to compromise on the way in which they do their research. Right? or the way they think about their research. So um, if, if you think about it, uh, you know, the anthropologist, it's all about describing the richness and complexity of the human experience in the world. Is that mathematically tractable? Absolutely not, <laughs> right? So in order, as an anthropologist, to step into a mathematics space and say, I want to collaborate on these problems, you can't say, I want to deal with these problems in their complete complexity and richness. You have to be willing to say, I want to find the core issues, the core ideas, the core components that drive these systems that are mathematically tractable. And that involves stepping down and saying, I'm willing to sacrifice those things that, that some people believe are the most important things in the world to get down to core principles that can be studied from a mathematical point of view. And for many social scientists, that's just a, a non-starter. For me, it's sort of the lifeblood of what I do every day. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, on, on my end of things, you know, the, the kind of simple models he's talking about are sort of our bread and butter. But at the same time, we, you know, we're in the dark as far as which direction to go. So we need Jeff to say, okay, here's the problem. Here's, um, you know, here are what I think are things that I think are important. I mean, we can also go and test these assumptions that Jeff is making about the model too, which is kind of fun. Um, I have some training in physics. I don't have a degree in physics, but I, I got pretty close to getting one when I was an undergrad. So, and I've done a lot of, published a lot of work papers in the physics literature. So um, I do think about modeling the real world um, in many different contexts. And, and what was really great working with Jeff was he came to me with a set of problems, but he understood right away the level of precision that we were going to want to take with these models, you know, that we weren't, that, you know, we, to quantify things, we need real data. It has to be rich. 
it has to be relatively complete. Um, you know, we have to, you know, we, we're, we're, we tend to go more from the bottom up than from the top down. Um, the other thing is that we're in the information age now. And so this is a time period when social sciences can be exploding in the kind of research they're doing by embracing things like machine learning, by, by even just by a, a embracing very simple quantitative models like the ones we started out with. There's a lot of, of um, ground that could be covered. Um, however, not at so many of the people in that those disciplines have the training to, right. to be able to make that handshake. Jeff um, actually spent his postdoc at the Santa Fe Institute where they have a lot of people in the physical sciences as well as the social sciences. And, and so he came to UCLA already with this very advanced training. And it was really, I remember the first meeting we had where he told me, um, I can almost quote directly, he said, he said, I've got automobile theft data. And I looked at him and I said, how, how good is the data? And I, he started describing this data set, you know, it was close to 50,000 events in one year. And he had the make model and year of the car, the GIS location from where the car was stolen and when. I mean, it was just, the data set was so rich. And I said, okay, that, this sounds like a serious guy. You know, we're, we ought to be able to do something with him. So I do, uh, I, I think Andrew is right. One of the parts of uh, problems with getting social scientists to engage more across the aisle, if you will, mm -hmm. with the, with, um, uh, the uh, mathematical sciences is that, you know, social scientists have trained, uh, or sorry, they've self-selected into non-quantitative ways of thinking about the world. And that creates a barrier. And they, they've often, you know, self-selected going back into high school or earlier into that track. I strongly believe that anybody has the potential capability to develop proficiency in understanding mathematics. And, and you know, I, I've taught courses on uh, geochemistry. I've taught courses on uh, uh, statistics and to social scientists saying, listen, don't be afraid of these things. If you just put time in, you can learn about it. And, and frankly, in, in the social sciences, if we can just get students to be uh, cognizant of and, and not afraid of those mathematical techniques, that's going to uh, be one of the things that really reduces barriers to mm -hmm. collaboration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I, we're actually running a few minutes over, so we're going to have to leave it there for now. But thank you both very much for joining us today. It's been a really great discussion. And if anyone viewing has additional questions, um, please, uh, if you're a Sigma Xi member, go to that communities page and leave your questions. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.